Yesterday we were talking about when Yosef reveals himself. And uh, uh, so, so when Yosef reveals himself, he uh, says, Ani Yosef, or on page 252. So he had mentioned that Yosef reveals himself, page 252, and then all, all of man's unanswered questions, all man's questions are, 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 are answered. So uh, the... Uh, the, uh, what do you call it? Uh, there are sources that say that in the world to come, part of, part of, uh, part of our, uh, like, like we were speaking about yesterday, when something, you can't figure something out, and all of a sudden you finally get it. So that gives you a certain sense of satisfaction. You know, that's what I told you. If you're working on a piece of Gomorrah, and then in sheer, finally you understand it, because then you, and you realize, oh, you know, oh, that's what Tos was saying. Oh, you know, it gets deeper. That's what the understanding is in the world to come. And, uh, yeah, and there are commentaries that say that it's going to be where every single thing that transpired in this world that you've wondered about is going to be explained. You know, why did you have to go through that? And why did this guy have something good happen? Why did the Cubs have to be so bad for so long? You know, I mean, there's got to be a reason for it. You know, and, and, and then it's going to just be more depth and more depth and more depth of understanding. The understanding is going to be it's going to be endless understanding. That's what the understanding of the world to come is going to be. So Yosef, we mentioned, we started talking yesterday, how when Yosef says to the brothers, Ani Yosef, Ha'odo Vichai, uh, Yosef is saying to, Yosef, to the brothers, I'm, as soon as he says, I'm Yosef, there's a world of understanding opens up. There's just a, an entire world of understanding opens up. So I want to tell you a medrash, remarkable, remarkable medrash, uh, that, that uh, the medrash says like this. There are different opinions what the source of this medrash is. Some... Uh, Trace it to the Arizal, to the Ariya Kodosh, uh, one say for it, it's a Medrash Kadmon, it's an, it's an early Medrash. But the Medrash says like this, it's a remarkable Medrash. The Medrash says that when Moshe Rabbeinu went up to, uh, it went up to get the Torah, so Moshe Rabbeinu asked God, what's that? There, there's a, so, there, there, so there's a Medrash that says he went up to ask God, why do the wicked suffer, why do the wicked pros, the righteous suffer and wicked prosper? That's, that's probably the biggest question people have, why do, why do bad things happen to good people? By the way, that book written by Harold Kushner, uh, who was a Reconstructionist rabbi, it's one of the biggest sellers in history. Um, there are, there are, I, think, I think it's the biggest seller uh, behind Harry, Harry Potter are you serious? and Impact. You know, the Impact series by me. Uh, and then the the uh, the uh, you know, so I'm running I'm running second, and and the what do you call it is there? It's, it's apparently the it is a massive seller. Now, you see, the problem with his book is like this: the book is considered complete uh, a complete heresy from a Torah point of view. A complete heresy because uh, what happened was he himself who can't judge the individual went through a very very t a terrible form of suffering. He had a son who was eight years old, and his son contracted a, one of the rarest, a, a very rare disease called rapid aging disease. There's a fancy oh. name, there's a fancy word, there's a fancy name for it, but it was called rapid, you know, there are 200 cases in history, whatever it is. The kid at 12 years, at eight years old, starts aging. No other symptoms, he just starts aging, and he goes through all the symptoms of old age, and at 12 years old, he died of old age. And he, he looked like an old man, just like a 90-year-old man when he, was, when he was 12 years old. So, so he had a terrible form of suffering. And the family just has to agonize and watch him. And, and so he writes this book that, well, his, the his thesis is that God controls the good of the, in the world, but the bad happens randomly and haphazardly, which I don't see that that's any consolation to anybody. You know, people found such consolation in the book to the contrary, you know, that random, that it could, ra bad could ran strike randomly. And we obviously, that, 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 that's completely antithetical to Torah. God controls everything. God controls the good, God controls the bad, and everything it happens, happens for a purpose. So Moshe Rabbeinu, that's, that, you know, and that's the age-old question that's always bothered people. And so, again, I'm not judging him on a personal level for the suffering, but the book itself is, 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 is blatant, uh, what we call kfir, it's blatant uh, 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 heresy. So um, the Medrash says like this, so Moshe Rabbeinu went up to God, and he said to God, why did the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper? Where is your justice in the world? So God says to Moshe Rabbeinu, I'll answer you as much as a human being is capable, I'll give you a glimpse of understanding, but even after I explain it to you, your understanding still will only be a tip, a tip, tip of the iceberg, 
compared to what really goes on, but I'll try to answer you as much as a human being could understand. So God shows Moshe Rabbeinu a vision. Now stay with us. You have to stay with the start to finish. God shows Moshe Rabbeinu a vision. And in the vision, Moshe Rabbeinu sees a soldier riding on a horse. It's a very hot day. And the soldier gets to a water hole. And he gets off his horse at the water hole to take a drink, and he bends down. And as he's drinking, he doesn't notice that he's got a money pouch in his pocket. And as he bends over, the money pouch falls out of his pocket. He doesn't notice it. He takes a drink, and he gets on his horse, and he rides away. A short time later, a 12-year-old boy comes by. He walks over to the water hole to get a drink, and he sees a pouch. He opens up the pouch. It's stuffed with gold coins. Grabs the gold coins. He goes running home happily. A short time later, a little old man comes by. Comes over, takes a drink, lies down, take a nap. And uh, in the meantime, the soldier's on his horse. And the soldier, you know, he touches his pocket. And I, oh, yeah. You know that feeling of panic you get when you can't find your wallet? You know, like that, there's that feeling. You don't even want to touch your other pockets because you'd rather live with hope than confirm the worst, you know? Mm -hmm. And then you tell you, oh, where is it? And the worst thing is when you go home and your parents say to you, your mom says to you, well, where did you lose it? You know, well, <laughs> well if, I, <laughs> if I knew where I lost it, it wouldn't be lost. Your mom, don't get smart, just answer your mother's question. <laughs> one of those. But, and then they make you search every pair of pants you've ever owned. You haven't worn them in 14 years. You know, just check every pocket. So the soldier touches his pocket, you know, and he's got that feeling of panic. So he thinks, hold on, where could it be? I must have lost the money at the water hole. So he turns back, he goes to the water hole, sees the little old man is lying there. He rides up to the old man, he gets off his horse, he kicks him, wakes him up. He says, listen, old man, you found my money, where is it? Tell me, I'm in a hurry, give it to me quickly. The old man's waking up, says, I don't know what you're talking about. He says, listen, if you don't give me my money quick, I'm going to kill you. The old man says, listen, I, honestly, I swear, I, don't, you know, I, I have no idea where he is. He says, listen, old man, I'm really in a hurry. And the old man says, Wait, please, please, I don't know where you're talking about. He takes his sword and he runs him through. And he searches his pockets, he doesn't find the money, gets on his horse, he rides away, and the vision fades. And God says to Moshe Rabbeinu, you see there's perfect justice in the world. So Moshe Rabbeinu says, no, I don't see any perfect justice. <laughs> Just like Eshai's face. I say, I don't see any, any justice at all. So God says, okay, I'll show you a second vision, let's see if this helps you out. Moshe Rabbeinu sees a vision, he sees a forest. In the forest, in the, there's a clearing, right in the middle of the forest there's a big clearing, and a father is taking a walk with his two-year-old toddler son. Now back in the thickness of the forest, there's a soldier sitting on a horse, and he's got a perfect view of the clearing. He's watching the father, just observing the father and his son walking through. And they're taking a nice walk, a nice stroll, a nice sight, bright sunny day. And all of a sudden, on the other side of the forest, a bandit jumps out, and he attacks the father. They start rolling around on the ground. The soldier's watching the entire thing, doesn't do, doesn't do anything. The bandit overpowers the father, he pulls out a dagger, and he stabs the father to death. He rifles through his pockets, and he finds a pouch stuffed with gold coins, and he grabs the pouch, and he starts running off. He's in such a hurry to, to, to run away, that in his haste to run away, he carelessly drops the pouch. Soldiers are watching this whole thing happen. He sees the bandit killed the father, bandit's running away, dropped the pouch, soldier sees the pouch, waits for the bandit to run, comes running in, rides in, takes the pouch, and he rides off. And again, the vision fades. So God says to Moshe, now, see, now, now you see there's perfect justice in the world. And he says, I'm clueless, clueless. Spiritual double feature, and I'm still clueless. Mm -hmm. So God says to Moshe, okay, I'll explain it to you, but just understand, even after my explanation, and you understand, you still don't understand. Just understand that this is as much as a human could understand. So says to Moshe Rabbeinu, look, the vision that you saw in the forest, the second vision I showed you actually happened 10 years before the vision at the water hole. So the soldier who lost the money at the water hole in the first vision was the same soldier who 10 years earlier had found the money in the forest when the bandit carelessly dropped it. The 12-year-old boy who found the money at the water hole in the first vision, 10 years earlier, was a two-year-old whose father was brutally murdered he should have inherited the money then. It took 10 years, and eventually he found the money at the water hole because that was the money that was really his. And the little old man who was murdered at the water hole 10 years earlier was a young bandit. He had murdered, and therefore he was murdered. And not only he was killed, but the same soldier who should have intervened in the forest and stopped him, it took 10 years, and eventually he caught him at the water hole and he killed him over there. God says to Moshe, you see, everything works. Everything fits into place. Everything fits right into place. And you could be utterly baffled, utterly, utterly puzzled. Where is the justice here? And one little detail 
you've got the wrong chronological order of what just happened. And if you know the chronological order, everything falls into flat place. So God says to Moshe Rabbein, you see there's perfect justice in the world. You see, the problem with you is you don't understand, and you don't see, and you don't know all the plans, you don't know why one thing is happening. So sometimes a person sees, why does that little old lady have to, have to suffer so much in the hospital? She's a little old lady who's got cancer. Oh, terrible. What, what could she have ever done wrong? But you don't know that when she, was, when she was a young lady, she was a drug dealer who was pushing drugs on school children. So you don't know, you don't, you don't know where she came from and where she's going, what she's doing. You, 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 don't, you didn't see the whole lifetime. We only see a very, very limited, very limited. There's another medrash, a very interesting medrash. There's a medrash, you know, you know we say it on, uh, what's that? It's like a Tarantino film. What's it too? Is that what's Tarantino? You see the film like, in different scenes. In of course, of course. And that's what life really is because we don't know what happened. We don't know what happened in a previous incarnation. And we don't know what happened in a previous lifetime. We don't know what happened in this lifetime. We don't know anything. All we see is a very limited, you see a very limited vision. But it, 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 that's what, that's what, so, so God is telling us, so in the, in the world to come, God's going to say, Ani Hashem. Meaning, total exposure to the truth. And all we're going to do is we're going to go, ah. Uh -huh. Oh, oh, and, and everything, every blade of, but every, but it's going to be, it's going to be with infinite depth because every blade of grass is going to have it. So why did that, why did I see that blade of grass that day? Why did that, why was, why did I end up in that store? Why was that guy so obnoxious? Why did the bus driver close the door on my head? You know, everything, everything that you, you know, and then you'll be shown that in a previous lifetime, you were a wagon driver and you used to ride the wagons over people's heads. You know, something like that. You know, you'll, you'll be shown that everything, everything that a person sees, everything a person sees is, is the, 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 and we, we're, it's unfathomable, you know, we, we just cannot comprehend it. Why did everybody end up in one place at one time when the boat sank? That means that God had to manipulate things to get everybody onto that boat in order for the boat to sink. Nothing was random and nothing was haphazard. And it's, it, it's absolutely infinite. That's, that's the understanding of the world to come. There's another interesting medrash. Uh, when medrash says that, uh, remember on Yom Kippur we read about the ten martyrs. We're actually going to speak about that in a little while. Read about the ten martyrs. You know what? Let's hold off on this for one second. I'll, I'll tell you in a second. So Yosef says to his brothers, Vayomer Yosef Pasuk Dalit. Vayomer Yosef El Echov, Gishuna Eli, Vayigoshu. Yosef says to his brothers, approach me. And they approach. Pasuk Dalit, page 252, Pasuk Dalit. It's right in the middle of the page. Page 252, right in the middle of the page, Pasuk Dalit. Vayomer Yosef El Echov, Gishuna Eli, Vayigoshu. Yosef says to his brothers, approach me. And they approach. I am Yosef, your brothers, your brother whom you sold to Egypt. Now, um, the first thing we see over here is, you know, in the previous post, Yosef has already identified himself. So why does Yosef go and have to identify himself again over here? So just for confirmation, just for confirmation, you'll notice that Yosef has one piece of identification here that is the ultimate piece of identification. The bris milah we'll see about in a second. What else? The speech. The speech also that he speaks lashon We'll we'll see and we'll 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 see. Kipi uh, amidabre uh, um, comes later, but the first piece of it is I'm Yosef, your brother, whom you sold. There's nobody who knows about that sale. Who knows about that sale? They're the only. He's the only one. Him and them are the only ones who know about it. I'm Yosef, your brother. They're shocked. Like whoa, that looks like it's really him. Guys, I'm Yosef, who you sold. Right? How could he possibly know about that? How could Yosef possibly know about that? Yosef is the only one in the world who knows about that besides them is him, because they made a band. Even Yitzhak Avinu, who knew about it, wouldn't tell Yaakov. Yaakov cried and mourned, even though his father knew about it. And Yosef calls him over. So when Yosef says, I'm Yosef, your brother, who you sold to Egypt, that's the ultimate identification. Okay? Now, look at Rashi, because Rashi says what Mr. Fogel brought up. It's a little, a little, a little, uh, a, 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 a little bizarre, this Rashi. Uh, Puzzle Dalid. It's a, it's the a left column, third line. Rashi says like this, um, left column, third line from the top. Gishuna Eli, approach me. Says Rashi, Ra osam nisogim la'ochor. He saw them moving back because they were afraid. Amar achshav ochai nichlamim. My brothers are embarrassed. Kora lehem beloshon raka v'tachanunim. He called them in a soft, pleading voice. Please, guys, please approach. Nothing to be afraid of. Veher Elohim shehu mohol, he showed them that he's circumcised. Now, at the plain meaning, that seems to be a bit indiscreet. Right? You know, call in front of 10 people to show them you're circumcised. They certainly seem to be indiscreet. And number two, there's even a bigger question. Even a bigger question. Let's say he had done that. 
what's the big deal? I mean, it doesn't identify anything because last week's parsha we learned that he had that he had decreed that all the Egyptians should be circumcised. Mm -hmm. Right. So what? What? Right. So what does showing you're circumcised prove? Everybody here is circumcised. But it was he who uh, decreed. Oh, that's what the commentaries say. When it says he showed them he was circumcised, it doesn't literally mean he showed them he was circumcised. He showed them. Ask around in this country. Ask around the country. You'll find everybody circumcised over here. Just ask anybody whose idea was it. Everybody's going to say, "Well, it's, it's you know, it's, it's the viceroy, that new viceroy. It was his idea. Where did I get an idea like that from? Where did I get an idea like that? That's the proof. That's the proof." And again, the, the, the idea of, of bris milah, which is the kedusha of that area of life, Yosef's emphasizing them, I'm your brother Yosef, and I've got this, I've retained this degree of kedusha in this area. And the chassam sofer, the commentaries say, somebody who's at a high enough level could look at somebody else and he could tell where he holds, where his status is in this area. In other words, like you can, you know, there's a concept of reading faces, and you can look at a person and see his spiritual level on face. So people who are on a high enough level, they can look at somebody's face and they can see where he's holding, especially in this area of life. And therefore, Yosef is saying to the brothers, knowing that they're on that level, remember, these are tremendous tzaddikim, Yosef says, hey, I'm Yosef, and I've been maintaining my kedusha in this area, and I assume you could see it on me. Right? That's what Yosef, that's what the Mephoshim say. What we're going to ask, uh, okay, now. Take a look at the next puzzle. This is what we want to get to. Yosef says, Ve'ata al te'atsu, and now don't be saddened. Puzzle, hey. Ve'ayichar be'inechem, don't be upset, ki mechartem mosihena, don't be upset that you sold me. Ki lemichya shalachani elokim lefechem. God has sent me here to be a, a how does he, a, a salvation, how does, how does the arts go through? To be a provider. Good word. God has sent me here to be a provider, because there is a famine, and you're going to need, you're going to need provisions, so don't be upset that you sold me. Now don't, he says, and now don't be upset that you sold me. So uh, uh, the, the, the basic meaning here is it's a way of comforting him. It says, listen, guys, don't blame yourself. Don't blame yourself. This is all part of a divine plan. You were only a, a you were only a, 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 a what do you call it, a, a, um, tool. a tool in the, in the divine plan that brought me about here. So I can say, so don't blame yourself. It actually worked out well. Okay, number one. Number two. What's the word ve'ata doing here? This is the word, the Hebrew word ve'ata, and now. He says, and now, don't be upset. Ata with an aleph is you. Ata with an ayin is now. What does it say, and now, don't be upset? Be upset before. No, good guess, but the opposite. In other words, like this. We never find that the brothers are punished for this. Never find any punishment for the brothers. Where do we find any sort of punishment for this at all? Somewhere in our liturgy. Somewhere in our liturgy, we find a punishment for this. The scattering of the tribes? Mm, no, that's an interesting a connection, but no. Do you remember on Yom Kippur, we say the dirge, the, uh, the, 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 the inserted into Musaf on Yom Kippur, we talk about the ten martyrs, that the Roman emperor calls in the ten martyrs, and he asks them, what is the law by Torah law? What's the law for kidnapping? And the ten martyrs say, well, the kidnapping of the law is uh, capital punishment. And he says, well, your brothers, your ancestors sold Yosef. They never find a punishment. There have never been ten men as great as you. And therefore, he puts them, he tortures them to death. Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Chanina ben Teradion, and, and Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel, and Rabbi Shmuel Kohen Gadol, the ten martyrs. Around Yom Kippur, we read that. And the whole thing begins with a conversation between the Roman emperor and these ten, these ten sages. Now, first of all, just from a historical perspective, I can realize the ten sages did not live at the same period the conversation ever took place. They did not live it. It was only poetic license, and we read it on Yom Kippur in order to, to tug at our heartstrings a little bit, to, to rouse us to the Chua. But the commentaries say, what Yosef is saying is, ve'ata and now al te'atzvu. Nothing to be said about now. Mm -hmm. But later on in history, there will be a time. Later on in history, there will be a time where there will be a reckoning for this. And according to the Arizal, Kabbalistically, those ten martyrs were reincarnations of the brothers. The ten martyrs that died, Rabbi Akiva is a reincarnation of Shimon, and each one of the, each one of the brothers is a reincarnate, each one of the ten martyrs, Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Shemim Gamal, each one of them is a reincarnation of one of the brothers over here, and eventually they're tortured to death. Okay, so that's what's alluded to in the word va'ata. 
Okay, now let's go back to what we were speaking about earlier. The, um, so Yosef is saying, don't be sad now, because, and again, in the Torah, we don't find any punishment for that. We don't find any punishment for the kidnapping and selling, which is a capital offense. It is a capital offense. So uh, um, it, it, there's, there's an interesting, now in that Yom Kippur, do you remember what, you know what I'm talking about in Yom Kippur? Do you read that in, in, the, in the, okay. So uh, the Medrash says like this, when the 10 martyrs are taken out to be killed, so the Medrash says there's a conversation between God and the angels. And the angels said, hey God, is this the reward for Torah? I mean, these people have to be tortured to death. That's the reward, zu Torah v'zu schara? This is the reward for Torah that they're telling these are the greatest scholars that torture to death. And God says, silence, it's a decree. And if I hear one more word, the angels, he says, if I hear one more word, I will turn the world to tohu vavo, to its original pre-creation state. Not another word. Okay? Now, the obvious question is, I mean, you know, what kind of answer is that? You say, is this the reward for Torah? Uh, not a word. It, uh, one more word, and I turn around. It's like, it's like your dad says to you, one more word, and you are, you're, you're grounded for two weeks. That's the best answer. That means dad hasn't got a good answer. And it stopped hocking me because I'm reading the newspaper. My daughter came into the room the other day. I was doing, I, I said, she, my daughter comes and she says, daddy, could I bother you? Because she knows you know, she's not supposed to hock. Daddy, could I hock you? So I said, you are right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only way to handle them. I just go out the nearest window. So, 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 what do you call it? You know, you know, you're hocking your dad. He's trying to read the newspaper, and he says, "Listen, that's it. Why, dad? But why not? One more word, and you're grounded for two weeks. That's the best you could do. That's the best you could do. So, I mean, God, the angels say, this is the decree. This is a reward for Torah. That's the best you could do. So, God says, one more word, I'll turn the world back to the pre-bar. So. I saw one of the Hasidic uh, masters, he says, he, he gives the following answer. Listen to this, he, 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 a very, very wonderful answer. What does the Medrash mean? You know what God's really saying? Because there's once a king, and the king hired a tailor to make him a suit. Make him a new, a new outfit. So the tailor makes this outfit, and the tailor's a master tailor, and he makes this outfit for the king, and the king is absolutely gaga over the outfit. He is just wild. It's absolutely beautiful. And he is just, all day long, all he does is talk about this suit. And it's very expensive material, very the finest material. So the king, the other ministers are jealous because the king keeps talking about this tailor, this tailor, and his new suit. They said, Excellency, you're right. It's a beautiful suit. It's a beautiful, what do you call it? Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. But, unfortunately, uh, the tailor has nipped away some of the material for himself. He's stolen some of the royal material. Impossible. I'm sorry, we're telling you, measure the suit. So the king measured. He started with five, five yards of material, and he only finds four yards of material in the suit. So he calls in the tailor and says, listen, you know, it's a beautiful suit, but if you stole from the royal coffers, you know, there's only one, you know, you're, you're punished, punished by death. So the tailor says, excellently, let me have the suit. So he takes the suit and he starts ripping out the stitching. The king says, you lost your marbles? I mean, if you weren't in tr enough trouble now, now you're destroying the suit, you know, instead of chopping off your head, now we're gonna have you drawn and quartered. You out of your mind? He says, patience, king. And he pulls out all the stitching and says, what are you doing? He says, look, you're a layman. I'm a professional. When I make the suit, I have to fold in the hems. You're right, you only measured four yards of suit. But there are five yards of material here, and I'll show you. I ripped out the stitching to put it back into the original state so you could see what it looks like in the original state. But if you look at it now, you have no way of understanding because you're, you're, you're a layman. I can't explain it to you. The only way thing I could do for you is to put it into original state and then you'll understand it. I can't explain it to you in the middle it, w w because you simply are, you cannot comprehend it. He says, that's what God was saying to you. God wasn't saying to the angels, one more word and you're punished, I'll put the world into your religion. God was saying, if you want to understand now why these 10 martyrs have to die, you have to have existed since before, since the absolute creation of the world to know how everything played out. If I would put the world back to tohu vavohu, and you could see how everything unfolded until this point, then maybe you'd understand. But right now I can't explain to you, you're incapable of understanding. That is the, that's the, 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 the what he called. So, we have no way of understanding. And the, and the Medrash is telling you, the only way you can understand is if you, if you were God, but you're not, so you won't. That's what the Medrash is saying. I heard a, a beautiful story once about a, uh, uh, um, 
They said this over at a funeral in England. You know, Rabbi Tisiao Solomon is the mashgiach of the gates of, of the Lakewood Yeshiva. So there's a funeral, a young man was nifter, and, you know, with all the questions that people ask. And, um, and uh, this young man was on his deathbed. So Matisio Salman, in order to comfort the family, he was at the funeral, and he said the following story. He said there was a young boy, the young boy was deathly ill. And the young boy was, was on his deathbed. And there's a great rabbi came to him and he said, listen, you know, the, 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 you know he, he, he's talking to him before he dies. He says, I want you to do me a favor. After you die, I want you to come back to me. I have three questions. I have one question on the Gemara that I need answered that I can't figure out. I have another question in Halacha Samia. And my third question is, why do young people have to die? Why do young people have to die? And when you get to the world of truth, I want you to ask these questions. I want you to come back and contact me and give me the answers. Short time later, the young man was, the, the boy was Nifter. And he comes to the sage in a dream. And he says to him, well, the first answer to your question on the Gemara, the answer is this, that, and the other. And the question on the, on the, uh, 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 on, on, on the, on, on, on the second th question, is this, that, and the other, whatever the answer is. As far as your third question, as far as why young people die, I could only tell you that I was wondering the same thing. And the closer I got to God's divine throne, the more I realized there's no question at all. That's the answer. Why? There will be an understanding. That's what he told him. So here, Yosef is saying to the road, when Yosef reveals himself, all the questions are answered. So the ten martyrs, they are going to be later in history, they become an atonement for the ten brothers as a reincarnation of, of, of the brothers. I'll tell you one other story. That, one other story I heard just to show you the workings of God, you know, because people are always skeptical. So there's a, it's kind of a, it's an apocryphal story. There's a Jewish guy comes to a rabbi. You know, anytime a rabbi's involved, you know, then, then this could be a good one, you know. <laughs> Jewish guy comes to a rabbi, says, Rabbi, listen, you know, I'm fabulously, I got a, a faith problem. He says, what's the problem? He says, I'm fabulously wealthy. I have three sons that are fabulously wealthy. I have three son-in-laws that are fabulously wealthy. I don't see any way God could make me poor. If I would lose my money, my sons would support me. If they would lose their money, their sons-in-law, they're not all about to buy. Barring a global apocalypse where everybody loses their money, I can't see any way that God could make me poor. So the rabbi says, listen, he could. He says, oh, I'm, what can I tell you? I don't see any way. He says, okay. And the guy leaves the rabbi, walks outside, and all of a sudden he gets this overwhelming urge to convert to Christianity. He's never felt that way before. He just wants to convert. So he walks over to the local church. He knocks on the door. The priest answers, he says, he has a yid with a, a beard and pace and a garthal. He says, yes, I want to embrace your religion, Father. So the heck you do. He says, no, no, I really, I do really, I really, please accept me. He says, there's only one way I can accept you. I, I, you know, I haven't got time to fool around. If you're sincere, I want you to sign over all of your material possessions to the church. So the guy says, just give me the paper. So he brings out the form. He says, I, Yankel Schwartz, sign over all my material possessions to the church. He says, okay, come back tomorrow at noon and we'll baptize you. So he leaves, walks back out into the street, and as soon as he hits the street, the urge to convert leaves him. He says, what have I done? I'm penniless, because I signed over all my possessions to the church. My sons aren't going to give me a dime. They're going to, die. They're going to sit shiva for me. My son-in-laws aren't going to give me a dime. They're going to disown me. I'm destitute. I'm penniless. Heads off back to the rabbi. He says, Rabbi, I got a problem. Is you, <laughs> is you again? He says, yeah, I'm destitutely poor, and I don't see any way God could get me out of this. And we've been through this once today already. He says, yeah, but this time I'm really, I don't see any way out of this. He says, do you believe? He says, I believe. Oh, do I believe? I believe. Oh, I believe. So he's talking to the rabbi. All of a sudden, they hear a fire engine. There's a fire in the church. There's no more paper, no more priests, no more church. The whole thing's gone. He's right back where he started from. <laughs> so, so the, you know, you know, yeah, so sometimes you wonder, how could God get me out of this mess? You know, God's got ways that you can't possibly imagine. God's got ways. I was just thinking about this week. I have a friend of mine who was in a bus accident. He got hurt in a bus accident. And uh, they, you know, he's going to get some money now from the lawsuit. And this is a guy who's always strapped for, strapped for money. Big family, strapped for money. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, God could bring it anyway. The last way you were thinking that God's going to get you the money is that you're on an egghead bus that gets hit by an Arab car that turns over three times and the bus spins out of control. Now, you weren't thinking of that as the way that you're going to make your money. You know, this guy, it could happen in any different way. 
that's the that's the degree. You know, we're clueless. We, we, we have, and I've seen it. I've seen it in life where where people come up with we're out of left field. I, I left in shidduchim especially, in shidduchim especially, the out of left field. You know, just absolutely out. Just when you thought, well, where is how could God possibly bring us salvation? I have a cousin. I have a cousin who's twenty five. Twenty five is considered considered a little older in the in, in the Torah community uh, for a girl. For a girl, for a girl, for a girl, for a boy, ninety. For a girl, for a girl, if, you know, you know, a girl who's twenty-one and not married, she's already getting panicky. You know, a boy who's twenty-one, a boy who's twenty-one, I get married, he's considering himself lucky. So the the, the what do you call it? the? Uh, she's about twenty-five. Her mother is a shadchan. Mother's a shadchan. Her mother is was was uh, uh, what's it called when you're linked up with everybody else? Um, what's the fancy word for being network? network. She's networked with all the shadchanim, not only in America and America, Israel, all over the world. Every night, she had files of names. She herself is a shotgun, looking through names, and names, 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 names. Okay, yeah, nothing. Yeah, one year after another year, girls 21, 22, 23, nothing. Oh, and all this, 24 hours a day, shidduchim, shidduchim, shidduchim. And then one day, their neighbor across the street, the sister-in-law was visiting. This is in Chicago. And she walks around Chicago. Chicago, there's a vegetable store, a fruit and vegetables, I think, called Pete's Fruit Shop. Some Greek guy. Pete, 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 Pete's Fruit Shop. On the van. So this lady is walking, and she decides, you know, she's taking a walk around Chicago. She decides to go get an apple, you know. In the meantime, my cousin with her mother, they go in to go do their fair weekly shopping. She walks into Pete's Fruit Shop, and this lady looks at her, and she goes, perfect for my nephew, Shimmy. Right? Three weeks later, they were engaged. You know? And that's after, after, after weeks and years of, of networking, doing everything you can. And out of, you know, words again, you know, some out of, le- out of left field, completely, you know, Pete's the Shadchan now. You know, Pete, <laughs> Pete, Pete gets the Shadchan money. You know, I, I, out of left field, you know, I go, re- absolutely ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. That's the, uh, that's the way you call it. So that's, that, that, that's the lesson. In any event, I told you a story about the rabbi, the dog, the rabbi, the guy calls up the rabbi, and he says, hey, rabbi, you know, my dog needs a bar mitzvah. So the rabbi says to him, listen, we don't do that sort of thing in our, in our shul. You know, you go maybe, maybe to reform temple down the block. <laughs> he says, yeah, but rabbi, I just want to tell you, you know, there's $50,000 to any synagogue that does the bar mitzvah. The rabbi says, well, why didn't you tell me the dog's Jewish? <laughs> <laughs> That's just a joke. The, uh... <laughs> okay. So, uh, <laughs> it's, it's actually a thing. They, 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 call it, they, they have a bark mitzvah. Yeah, they have a bark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Got a bark yeah. mitzvah. Yeah, that's beautiful. The, uh, the, uh, the. Um, okay, so Yosef sends goes on, and let's go on. The uh, the uh, yeah Snoop Dogg. The uh, what do you call the? Uh, so Yosef Yosef goes on, and then take a look. Take a look at um, Pesach Tess. Yosef said, top of page 254. Yosef says, Maharu elavi, quickly go up to my father. Vamarte may love, ko amar bincha Yosef. So says your son Yosef. Samani elokim lo adon lo lechol mitraim. God has made me the master over Egypt. Rida Eli, al ta'amod, come down to Egypt, don't stay there. Don't stay in Israel, come down to Egypt. Now, uh, you'll notice Yosef is trying to, Yosef has to desperately somehow uh, 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 identify himself to his father who he hasn't seen for so long. What does Yosef use as a form of identification? What's going to be the best identification for Yaakov Avino? That somehow that Yosef has maintained his spiritual level. So what does he say? Look at the word, look at the wording carefully. Yosef doesn't say, tell my father that I'm the ruler over Egypt. What does he say? God. God has made me the ruler over Egypt. Right? Oh, oh, I see. I see that this is my son has maintained his loyalty. That's going to be the first crack. The first, the first chink in the armor is going to be that that Yosef show, shows that. We'll see tomorrow what the other. I just want to show you one last point. Go back for a second. One very, very fascinating point. In 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 uh, Pasuk Dalit again. Back on two fifty two. I skipped this. I, very very interesting. Um, so in Pasuk Dalid, uh, Yosef wants to, uh, y- Yosef shows the brothers four types of identification. You know, it says that, we, why were they were the Jews? What was the merit of the Jews being redeemed from Egypt? They didn't change their names. 
They didn't change their language. They didn't change their clothing. And they were not involved in immorality. Those are the four merits that got the Jewish people out of, out of Egypt. So the commentary said like this. Yosef says to them, first of all, I'm Yosef. Paro had named him Sofnas Paneach, which was a Jew, which was an Egyptian name. And Yosef says to the brothers, first of all, I'm Yosef. I still go, I still go by my Hebrew name. Number one. Number two, later on, this is what, what uh, Eliasaf was doing, he says, Ki pi My mouth is speaking to you. I'm speaking Loshon HaKodesh. Number three, the Brismila, which shows that he's not, that he's what he called, he's, he, he, he kept the kid without the getting involved in immorality. And number four, Yosef, sorry, I made a mistake. Number four, the Jewish people got out of Mitzrayim because they weren't snitchers on each other. They didn't snitch on each other. Yosef, they weren't informers. Yosef calls them closer and reveals himself so that Binyamin should not hear. Binyamin shouldn't hear because Binyamin doesn't know about the sale and he won't find out about the sale. And you want to hear something incredible? Wow. Next week's Parsha, next week's Parsha says that Yosef Yaakovinu was living in the land of Goshen for 17 years after Yaakov come down. And there's a, med, there, there, there's a medrash that says the entire 17 years, Yosef made sure never to be alone with Yaakov if he in a room. He didn't want to be in a position where Yaakov says to him, what did happen that day? He didn't want to have to tell what the brothers have. This is what the medrash says. So in the merit of those four things that Yosef was able, that's where it gave the Jewish people is the energy, the strength to be able to maintain that later on. So it's Yosef's merit. Because and the merit of, yes, okay. and, yeah, the Yosef instills, not only that, there are commentaries that say that what gave the Jewish people, see, there's, there's a lot of spiritual depth here, it's not just a simple story. There are commentaries that say, what gave the Jewish people the strength to overcome the immorality of Egypt? Because Yosef, in Yosef they, had two, they had two precedents to overcome the immorality of Egypt. What were they? Sora Imenu. Now remember, we, we only read the story while Paro took Sarah and they, you know, the Malach smacked them, you know, and everybody went home happy. She was under tremendous pressure. You know, Paro, Paro said, hey, listen, lady, I'm going to make you a queen. Instead of living with that wanderer, you could be a queen over here. We'll knock him off and you'll be the queen. You know, you'll be like, what do you call the president of the United, the wife of the president of the United States, and you could bear hug the queen of England, too. You know, nobody's going to stop you. Know, <laughs> and, you, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're head honcho over here, you know, and, and, and everything, everything that goes with it, you know. But sorry, Mano overcame it. That gave the women the strength. And Yosef overcomes the, the temptation that gives the men the strength. That's where the Jewish people got the strength from. All right, to be continued. Mm -hmm.